chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD is a chronic airway disease. Okay, a chronic airway disease. And it's made up of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Okay, chronic bronchitis and emphysema are both categorized as a COPD. So just a little FYI, general knowledge to help you guys kind of wrap your head around the importance of COPD. According to the National Institutes of Health, COPD is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Currently, millions of people are diagnosed with COPD. Many more people may have the disease and not even know it. COPD develops slowly. Symptoms often worsen over time and can limit your ability to do routine activities. Severe COPD may prevent you from doing even basic activities like walking, cooking, or taking care of yourself. And those are called ADLs, activities of daily living. Most of the time, COPD is diagnosed in middle-aged or older adults. The disease isn't passed from person to person. You can't catch it to someone else. And COPD, as of now, has no cure. Doctors don't know how to reverse the damage to the airways and lungs. However, treatments and lifestyle changes can help you feel better, stay more active, and slow the progress of the disease. So to summarize that, very prevalent in the population. It's something that the etiology is a developed slowly. So it's with older patients. So if you're seeing a clinical example or a case study, and let's say you're working in an emergency room, and if you have a five-year-old come in, that's not going to be COPD. Okay, that's going to be most likely asthma. So COPD has no cure yet, but we're going to talk about the different management strategies and we break those into um, <clears throat> managing stable patients. And then what we'll see even more in our clinical experience is managing patients with an exacerbation, meaning an increase in severity of their symptoms that brings them for extra treatment. So once again, when we talk about COPD, we're talking about airflow limitation. So if we think about airflow, air carries what very important pulmonary gas from the environment to our lungs. Oxygen. Yeah. Exactly. Oxygen, right? So um, if, we, if we don't have that good airflow, um, we're going to have low oxygen. Okay. So in chronic bronchitis, there's chronic inflammation due to enlarged mucus glands, increased number of goblet cells, and a decreased number of cilia. And in emphysema, there are enlarged distal air spaces. And then in um, more severe late-term emphysema, destruction of lung parenchyma, loss mm -hmm. of elasticity, mm -hmm. and then once again, that airflow limitation, the airway collapse on exhalation. Uh, Jamie, what is yeah. parenchyma? Very good question. Parenchyma is the alveoli, the functional unit of the lung. Thank you. So there are two major types of emphysema. Um, panlobular, um, which has an etiology of an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which we'll talk about, is not as common as the centralobular. So the problem here is with the respiratory bronchioles. So panlobular, centralobular. Centralobular uh, is much more common than panlobular. So what alpha-1 antitrypsin is, is it's a glycoprotein secreted by the liver. It inhibits enzymes, which destroys elastase. Elastase destroys elastic tissue. So we're talking a lot, talking about a lot of double negatives here, inhibiting enzymes, which destroy a destructor, okay? So if you don't have this alpha-1, or if it's not working, then the um, final outcome is going to be lung tissue breakdown, okay? So it'll be the same outcome as the traditional central lobular uh, COPD, whereas it, it, in the end, the lung tissue gets broken down. 
So, <clears throat> Cynthia, to, to, to talk about your question, you said, what is the lung parenchyma? Mm -hmm. This is a normal, healthy lung parenchyma. Okay, this is miles and miles and miles of lung tissue. Okay, this is alveoli. Um, we describe them as little grapes, but as it is absolutely not little grapes. It is a large interconnected web of type one, type two, and type three pneumocytes. Okay, and I love this picture because it really microscopically shows all of the surface area here on the lung parenchyma where gas exchange is taking place. So this is a healthy lung. Now let's come down here to this lung where there is a significant loss of elastic tissue right here. Is gas exchange taking place here? Not much. Not at all, that's correct. Okay. Etiology. So the main etiology of COPD is cigarette smoking. Do you guys remember when we talked about uh, pack years? Do you guys remember what pack years are? So, um, and I should also add in, in addition to cigarette, marijuana as well, um, or anything else, methamphetamines. Um, um, when, they, when people smoke meth, they use a lot of different chemicals like talc um, that can, um, you know, that can, uh, additives that can cause a lot of damage to the lung parenchyma. Uh, pollutants, chronic irritation, repeated infections. So anytime you have that irritation, you're going to have inflammation. You're going to have that bronchoconstriction from that extra inflammation and mucus production. So you're going to have that airflow limitation. Okay, diagnosis of COPD history. So we just talked about smoking pack years. That is the number of packs per day multiplied by how many years someone has smoked. So if we said someone has smoked one pack of cigarettes for 40 years, that's a 40 pack year smoking history. If someone smoked two packs of cigarettes per day times 20 years, that is also a 40 pack year smoking history. Okay, and so anytime you have a patient with greater than a 20 pack year smoking history, um, you can start to suspect that they may have COPD. Spirometry is the absolute objective test to say a patient has COPD. We don't, we can't just look at somebody and um, say that they have hypertension. We have to check their blood pressure. We have to measure their blood pressure, right? Well, same thing with COPD. We have to, we have to perform the spirometry um, and we have to look at these numbers. So in general, um, the FVC and the FVV1, one or both, have to be less than 80%, but the most, most distinctive, distinctive uh, uh, variable here is your FVV1 over your forced vital capacity needs to be less than 70%. Okay, so FVC, FVV1, and then your FVV1 percentage under 70%. Now, DLCO is the third major portion of a full pulmonary function exam. And your DLCO is the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide um, across the alveolar capillary membrane. So that's what it's measuring is diffusion. So in addition to spirometry, if somebody got a full PFT uh, in the body box, um, they could get their DLCO um, measured. And if that is less than 80%, that is a good indication of emphysema as compared to chronic bronchitis. Can anybody thinking about the pathophysiology, the structural changes of COPD, why would it most likely be emphysema and not chronic bronchitis? It would be because in emphysema, um, the surface areas decreased because of the yep. destroyed parenchyma. Absolutely. You're exactly correct. When you, when you take away, so let's go back. Here, right there. When, when you, you're supposed to have this, but when you have this, there's not going to be that surface area. So, of course, there's not going to be as much diffusion happening. So, very good. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody remember what type of epithelial cells these are? 
The pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Excellent. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar, and they have the cilia on there. And what does that do? That helps with our mucociliary, mucociliary escalator to remove the pathogens from our tracheobronchial tree into our oropharynx, where we either number one, swallow them and our stomach acid takes care of the pathogens, or we can cough them out, okay? You guys remember what this type of um, uh, epithelium is? Like simple squamous? Simple squamous. Yes, it sure is, very good. Now, this is a great picture. This is a bronchoscopic view. Based on what we learned last semester, somebody tell me what we're looking at. So this is taking a scope and going down someone's tracheobronchial tree. This is showing the right, the, the main stem bronchi branching off to the left and right. Going. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The two lobes and then the three lobes, you could see it going. Perfect, so Emily, which one is, uh, which one is this one, right or left? That is the right. Excellent. And this one is the left. And you knew that because of the lobes. The lobes. Yes. Yeah, you could just see it. Just That's see great. It. There's three lobes on the right, two on the left. What do you guys think going down this way? The esophagus. Yes, it sure is. Gosh, you guys are on it. Good job, you guys. <clears throat> well, once again, here we go. Okay, now this is the normal. This is a good long. This is not. <laughs> okay, this is what we call a macrophage. What is the macrophages, um, what, is, what is their role? They like eat up bad stuff. Absolutely, perfect. They, they phagocytize or eat up the, the pathogens, good. And then one thing I wanted to show you guys, this is a great picture here of alveoli. These are little things called pores of con. And that allows for um, collateral uh, airflow or ventilation to go through all the different um, alveoli. So once again, it's not, it's not grapes. It's this interconnected web of lung parenchyma where gas exchange takes place. And then down here, we're looking at a macrophage eating a pathogen. Good. Three primary symptoms of COPD, dyspnea, cough, and sputum production. Can somebody remind me what dyspnea is? Shortness of breath. Good. Is that you measuring that or the patient stating the short of breath? They're stating that? Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. It's a subjective statement from a patient saying, hey, I'm having a hard time breathing. Okay. And then cough and sputum production. Other symptoms, and I had a great question this morning. It was like, how am I going to keep track of these symptoms? Well, for one, repetition. Two, think about the structural changes that happen and the resulting clinical manifestations that result from those anatomic changes. So secondary symptoms we might see are hepatosplenomegaly. So our liver and our spleen getting enlarged as well as pedal edema. Well, that comes from extra fluid being built up, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Accessory muscle use, that's due to increased work of breathing. Our diaphragm and our intercostals are our main muscles of ventilation, but when there's some sort of pathophysiology um, that's, say, blocking our airway, we need those um, accessory muscles to help uh, get the airflow in that we need. Cyanosis, okay, that's... Um, a patient turning a bluish color, and that is due to hypoxia. And then, of course, wheezing from bronchospasm and mucus. So wheezing um, is the clinical manifestation from the anatomic alteration of a narrowed diameter or airflow limitation in tracheobronchial. So just like we would measure blood pressure, vital signs, spirometry, we can actually um, measure the patient's dyspnea. So um, we, the, the main um, dyspnea scale, and there are many, but the main dyspnea scale that's uh, kind of the most popular one right now, according to gold guidelines, is the MMRC, the Modified Medical Research Council Dyspnea Scale. So Grade zero means I only become breathless with strenuous exercise. 
Isn't that familiar? I'm the same way, huh? <laughs> Number one, so, the, so the patient gets a score of zero. Number one, I become short of breath when hurrying on the level or walking up a slight hill. So walking on a flat surface uh, when I'm hurrying or going up a hill. Well, shoot, I'm there as well. <laughs> That's because I'm not in the best shape. Number two, I walk slower than most people the same age on the level because of breathlessness, or I have to stop for breath when walking at my own pace on the level on a flat surface. That's getting a little bad now. I stop for breath after walking 100 meters or after a few minutes on the level. Or number four, I am too breathless to leave the house or breathless when dressing or undressing. So we, we keep track of the patient's dyspnea, one, because it kind of tells us the progression of the disease and how it affects the patient's ADLs, activities of daily living. And then two, say if they get a management or a therapeutic, uh, it's, a, it's a good way to kind of test and see if it's working. Spirometry classification. Now I'm gonna please ask you to memorize this. So I would recommend you, um, I would recommend you making a note card or whatnot uh, for the spirometry classification. So we have stage one through four. Mild is when the FEV1 over the FVC is less than 70%. However, that FEV1 is greater than 80%. Stage two moderate is when that ratio is less than 70%, but the FEV1 is 50 to 80%. Stage three severe is that same lower than 70 ratio with the FEV1 between 30 and 50%. And then stage four, very severe, is when that FEV1 is less than 30%. Okay, so that's, a, that's, a, that's how we stage the stages and severity of COPD. This I'm gonna talk uh, about, but I don't need you to memorize this one. So this is something called the Bode Index, and you will see as healthcare expands and we have more patients, fewer therapists and physicians, a lot of things are protocolized and um, driven with um, guidelines, okay? So this is one that we can objectively measure different clinical manifestations and, and diagnostic data that we take from the patient um, to kind of help uh, categorize them as well. So the FEV1 percentage we already talked about, um, the, the lower that is, the higher the score. The higher the score, the more severe the illness is. The six minute walk test is something um, we're gonna try and do next week. It's a lot of fun. It's when the, it's when the respiratory therapist um, makes the, has the patient with COPD in an outpatient setting, um, walk a little course, and then measure how many meters they can walk in that six minutes, okay? So uh, greater than 350 meters is zero, less than 149 meters, it would be a more severe level three. And then that dyspnea scale, we've talked about the dyspnea scale, so the more dyspneic they are, the higher uh, a number is um, given to them for their vote index. And then finally, this might be something opposite to what you're thinking about. If a patient has a BMI, a body mass index, greater than 21, they get a zero. But if it's less than 21, they get a one. So why do you think that, you know, generally we learn, you know, the, the greater the, the BMI, the more disease might, that might happen. But here it's opposite. Can anybody kind of postulate why this might be the case? Isn't it because you would calculate tidal volume based on their mass? No, I'm afraid not. It's it doesn't have anything to do with tidal volume. We're looking at we're looking at outcomes of mortality, how severe the disease is, patient outcomes. Why would a bigger patient be less likely to pass? I guess because their breathing is restrictive. Uh, yeah, it's obstructive. Okay, let me let me talk to you guys about this. 
Where do your calories go? Do you guys have to spend your calories breathing? No. Nope. Okay, no. However, if you are always using your accessory muscles to breathe, a lot of your energy and a lot of the, your, your work of breathing or energy will go towards breathing, will, will uh, take away body mass. So if you're working really hard to breathe, you're, you're going to have a smaller body habitus. Does that make sense? Because you're burning calories using all those muscles. Exactly. Yep. Okay. More clinical manifestations looking at imaging. So imaging is our chest x-rays, CAT scan, MRIs. Uh, we're, we're thinking about hyperinflation, okay? We're thinking about hyperinflation leading to a flattened diaphragm, perhaps cardiomegaly in chronic bronchitis, in which we'll talk about. And then an increased anterior to posterior diameter, and we call that barrel chest, okay? So we would generally have a greater transverse di diameter, but when we have severe air trapping, it really changes the shape of our thoracic cavity into what we would call a barrel chest. Patients will experience chronic hypoxia. And due to that, as a result, patients will uh, be polycythemic. Do you guys remember what polycythemic is? They have more red blood cells. Absolutely. It's the opposite anemia. They will produce more red blood cells to compensate and try to carry more oxygen. Well, that will uh, uh, create core pulmonale from an increased red blood cell, blood viscosity, and then as a result, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay, we just talked about accessory muscles of ventilation. Once again, the diaphragm and the intercostals are what we use to take a normal breath. Well, if we have, say, COPD with airflow limitation, we might use our transverse abdominis, our internal intercostals, rectus abdominis, and then our external and internal obliques. And those are all down around um, our, our lower portion of our uh, thoracic cavity and in our abdominal muscles because... We, we, we can get that breath in, but then we're trying to really squeeze that out. And think about if you're squeezing, trying to squeeze out toothpaste, you start at the bottom and move up, right? So kind of the same thing. Now, if you were having a problem on inhalation, inspiratory, you would see more scalene, trapezius, external intercostals, pectoralis, and the sternocleidomastoid, which are um, more of our um, upper back and neck. Okay, so let's talk about core pulmonale. Let's say your patient has chronic bronchitis. In the patient with chronic bronchitis, they are going to experience, due to all of that mucus buildup, and then they're gonna have a, they're gonna have a hard time with diffusion, so they're gonna experience hypoxemia. Well, hypoxemia is then gonna lead to pulmonary vasoconstriction. So a constriction around all of the vessels in the pulmonary vasculature. And that's supposed to be a, um, an adaptive uh, physiology trait so that not a lot of air and, and blood flow will go to those areas of the lungs that are, that are not um, having gas exchange. So it's supposed to be a good thing. However, that'll increase our pulmonary artery pressure will then increase the workload of our right heart and blood then will back up and go into our jugular vein. So JVD, jugular venous distension, hepatosplenomegaly, extra fluid in our liver and our spleen and pedal edema, which pedal edema is the fluid that accumulates in the dependent areas. So down in our lower extremities. Okay, so, so patients with chronic bronchitis tend to experience more core pulmonale. And so on chest X-ray, they would have a larger heart, the cardiomegaly. Patients with emphysema tend to not have this, and they'll just have more of a teardrop-shaped heart. And we, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but think of core pulmonale, chronic bronchitis. 
Here is a lovely picture of a what we call a bolli or a bleb, and that's just a piece of um, a piece of lung tissue, a piece of our lung parenchyma that's filled with air, and it's not participating in gas exchange. Okay, and then this one, of course, is a um, after an autopsy, so it's a um, an emphysema lung um, that also is enlarged and has um, color dis, you know, it's discolored most likely from smoking or irritants or something. And it's just, it's just big. Okay. It's just a really big lung. It looks dead. It's definitely dead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then here's another picture of just um, <clears throat> the alveoli or the lung parenchyma that's just lost a lot of elastic. More pictures of that. And then this is a good um, image of uh, a, um, a chest X-ray where the retrosternal space is enlarged as the lungs meet in front of the heart. So retrosternal, behind the sternum, okay? So right here, you can see all of this, this retrosternal airspace. So this is um, pushing on the heart and compressing it um, and even kind of pushing it over to the side as well. So different diagnosis that you could say, or we could say differential diagnosis would be asthma, CHF, bronchiectasis, tuberculosis, and obliterative bronchiolitis, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so um, this is where we're gonna stop lecturing and I am going to um, show you guys some of these um, some of these management techniques. So, as I said before, um, we talk about management strategies as with stable and COPD exacerbations. Okay, so. <clears throat> I have here a lot of examples of medications that patients with uh, COPD will be prescribed and given. So this first one here is albuterol. And albuterol is what we call a SABA, okay? A short acting beta agonist, okay? So it goes to the receptors and tells the um, beta two cells to um, cause bronchodilation, open up, okay? So here we would shake up our pressurized meter dose inhaler where a propellant and a medication mix together. We would shake this up really good. We would squirt it, the medication, into the spacer, and then we would take a big inhalation and hold for about 10 seconds to really allow that medication to go into the lungs and work its magic and the airways as well. So um, a good question I had this morning was, well, why do we have to use one of these spacers? Well, the reason why is once again, there is a propellant with a medication and you want those to mix to be effective. And if you put that right up to your mouth, a lot of that, it's just those, those little microscopic um, uh, medication pieces are just gonna go right onto your tongue and won't get down and, and deposit uh, where they're supposed to, okay? This, and if anybody has asthma or knows anybody closely with asthma or COPD, you'll know that this is what's called a rescue inhaler. Patients, and the more severe they are, need to have this with them all the time, okay? This is their rescue inhaler. When they start feeling really short of breath, they need to take this. It's gonna work right away, but it's not gonna last that long, okay? So the effect is not gonna last very long. And so therefore, a patient may need to be on a maintenance medication. And there's three types of major maintenance medications. <clears throat> and there's, there's a lot of them, but there's only three major types. So, um, a LAMA is the number one choice at first, and that stands for a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. 
an antagonist, a muscarinic antagonist is going to say, block that and don't allow bronchoconstriction. So, so instead of telling the cell bronchodilate, it's going to say, don't bronchoconstrict. So it works the same way to keep the airway open and cause bronchodilation, but it just works the opposite way. So a llama, long acting muscarinic antagonist. There's also technically a short acting muscarinic antagonist. Anybody seen one of these before? This is called combivent. Combivent, if nebulized form, it's called a duoneb. It is a combination of albuterol and a um, sh short acting muscarinic antagonist hypertropium bromide, AKA atrovent. Okay, so this one works differently too. Move this, you click this, and then you just push this little button and poof, this aerosol comes out. Okay, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a interesting little device, but it's becoming really popular and you don't need a spacer to go with this. Um, you would just you would just get this, and so this is the the delivery device is called a respamat, and hold on, there we go. The delivery device is called a respamat, and you will actually um, learn the indications for the medications, indications for medications and patho, the advanced actions in farm. And the delivery device is in equipment slash therapeutics. So um, lot, lots to learn, but you guys can do it. Saba, Saba, and Sama. Then we have something called, where is it, right here. Then we have something called a llama, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Okay, so that's the first line of therapy for COPD, and this is in a, thing called a press air. And then we have a long acting beta agonist, which is solumeterol. And then, well, before I mention that, so I talked about the Saba. Then I talked about for maintenance, Lama and Laba. But what, when we're talking about structural changes, all of those are for bronchodilation. We didn't say that patients necessarily have inflammation. They do have inflammation in uh, chronic bronchitis as, as a result of, of um, chronic irritation and, and, and more mucus production, but they don't necessarily have that humoral response. So the one way you would find if they did or not is get an eosinophil count. So does anybody know what an eosinophil count is? What is an eosinophil? It's a white blood cell. White blood cells. It is. It's a white blood cells that increases in number during an allergic reaction. So before the doctors will put a patient um, indication wise, before they will put them on a straight steroid, they'll take their in eosinophil count. And if it's high, which a lot of them are, a lot of people have like a overlap syndrome, a COPD and an asthma together, um, then they'll give them a steroid, okay? A llama, a laba, and a steroid are your three maintenance drugs for COPD. Llama, laba, steroid. Then you have all your combination medications. This is a discus of a saba, excuse me, not a saba, a laba, and a corticosteroid. This one is a, God, I can't even see, I'm getting old. A llama and a corticosteroid, it's a Symbacord, okay? So there's lots of different types. Now, has anybody been watching TV and they hear something and they say, if you have COPD, you could get something called Trilogy. And then they have a somebody singing, um, uh, trilogy. It's easy as one, two, three. Uh -huh. <laughs> what do you think that one, two, and three means? Um, the side effects? Nope. Oh, the llama. So, uh, three. Llama, llama. Exactly. Llama, exactly. Okay. Exactly. 
It's a combination of a llama, a lava, and a corticosteroid. And it was just approved this year, 2020. Was It, it was in the works before, but it's now like an approved medication for COPD. So is it better to have all three? What's that? So it's better to have all three? If it's indicated. So if you have the high eosinophil count and you've already been on this and this and this and this and you're still having um, exacerbations, so the more exacerbations you have, yes, then it's better just to be on all three. Because what if I said, okay, Sheridan, you've got COPD, okay? First, I did your spirometry. I explained spirometry. You have COPD. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a Saba. I want you to take a Llama. And I checked your eosinophil count. That's high. So I want you to take this when you need it. I want you to take this. And then I want you to take this and then this way. Got that? Okay, have a nice day. Here's your medications. No. <laughs> you so guys didn't get that. And you're very intelligent, healthy individuals. What if you are have advanced age, you're elderly, you can't breathe, you're hypoxic, maybe you have arthritis, so you can't even do this, you don't speak English, okay? There's a lot of barriers to health. So we always come up with new medications and new delivery devices and all of this stuff. So patient, my, my point to all of that is, is spending time and educating the patient. This is where you are beyond helpful, okay? Um, a lot of hospitals, if you work in a bigger hospital, they'll have respiratory therapists as care coordinators for COPD. So they'll go in and, and you know talk with the patients, do education, make sure they understand um, say, same with like asthma. So um, uh, something I always uh, had was my AEC, my certified asthma educator. And um, but even if you don't have that, you, you go in the hospital and you, you come up, you do um, a formal asthma education. You do it early and you do it multiple times so that the patients don't just get it one time and say, oh, you know how to use it, right? Well, they might say, yeah, because they're overwhelmed and they want you out of your, their room. But um, you know, and then and then really, really getting to the bottom of it and making sure they understand when to give the meds, how, when it's indicated, what are contraindications. Oh, that's a lot. Okay, now another thing with all phases of and severities of asthma, excuse me, of COPD. Two other things. Well, there's there's more, but um, reducing risks. So lifestyle changes. Of course, smoking cessation is huge, okay? Um, so, you know, five steps of, of smoking cessation, which we'll talk about a little bit more next, um, next week. That is very important, as well as both your annual flu vaccine, I haven't even mentioned COVID, your annual flu vaccine, and as well, your pneumococcal. Has anybody heard of pneumococcal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pneumococcal pneumonia is the number one type of community acquired pneumonia. If you have COPD and, and, and get the seasonal flu strain A through Z, I don't know, um, you know, there's a chance that you won't make it. You know, a pneumonia could follow that um, flu and, and, and really take COPD patients um, really hard time to recover. Same with pneumococcal, community acquired, pneumo community acquired pneumonias. And that's an encapsulated bacteria that's very difficult for your, your immune system to fight. So getting those two vaccines are very important. Smoking cessation, everybody having their rescue inhaler, and then maintenance medications. Now, look around the lab. There is something that you may be seeing or may not be seeing, but there's one medication that is the only medication to reduce mortality in COPD? Oxygen. oxygen. Yes, ma'am, very good, so oxygen. Okay, so when patients are hypoxic, uh, they'll need to be on oxygen. When they come visit you in the emergency room or the general care ward or the ICU, you might use something here called the heated high flow nasal cannula, okay? So this is a nasal cannula, it fits in 
right here. No, I'm not putting it up my nose, so you can touch it when you come back to the lab next week. Um, if you notice, it has a much larger bore tubing. It's got a circuit, and it's connected right here to a heater and a humidifier. Your two types of flow meters, a low flow and a high flow. The standard flow for this is 60 liters per minute. 60 liters per minute. And then you can blend the oxygen, so meaning you can change the FiO2. So you could give this with 21%, so just room air, but they might need it for the flow. But most likely they're gonna need, um, you know, an FI, extra ox, supplemental oxygen above 21% to be therapeutic. Now, if the patient's hypoxic, they could try this and they have increased work of breathing, try this. What if, what if they have an accompanying high PaCO2 level? What might you need to put them on at that point? BiPAP. Yay, very good. So this is our brand spanking new, I just put it together on um, uh, Wednesday, our new BiPAP machine. And it can um, do both. It can do CPAP, BiPAP, something called AVAPS, which is BiPAP with a volume guarantee. And it can also do heated high flow nasal cannula. Now, I don't know how to work that yet, so I need some help, but um, I'll, I'll get them help. I'll show you. Um, but yeah, if they have a uh, high CO2 hypercarbia during their COPD exacerbation, they're going to need you to put them on non invasive ventilation. Who knows at what pH level is this probably not going to work? We need to put a breathing tube in. Does anybody remember that number? Lower than oh, lower than seven three five. Two five. Two five. Sorry, two five. Yeah. Yes, you guys are fantastic. Good job. So yeah, if it's less than seven point two five, according to the NBRC hospital, you'll skip non-invasive and just intubate them and ventilate them in an invasive manner. 